UFC 300 this Saturday night from the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. In the main event, Alex Pereira defends the light heavyweight championship against Jamal Hill. 13 fights on this card. I'm not going to sit here and act like this isn't the greatest card the UFC's ever put on. Let's just be honest. Like, this is probably the best card. The only one that's somewhat comparable, I think, is UFC 100. Um, that card had Brock Lesnar, Frank Mir. It had GSP on it. Hendo Bisbing, of course, the big knockout. Mark Coleman was on the undercard. John Jones on the undercard. Jim Miller, Tom Lawler, uh, John Fitch, Akiyama. Like, there were names on that card. I'll make the case 300 is better than 200. I get it. Like, there's no Anderson Silva. There's no Daniel Cormier. Brock Lesnar was on 200. But that was made evented by Amanda Nunes and Misha Tate. This one does have probably the biggest star the UFC could put on for this show in terms of scheduling in Alex Pereira. So I think this is probably the best card they've ever put on. I think it probably is better than 100. I think. But again... It's really solid. There is not a bad fight on this card. So let's get into it. 13 fights on this one. And folks, if you haven't yet, though, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for some more MMA here on the channel. Tomorrow, we will have our PFL predictions with the light heavyweights and the lightweights um, on the card. So make sure to come back for that one coming up tomorrow. But let's do it. 13 fights on UFC 300. And we will start things off in the bantamweight division between Deuce Tegueda, Deuce and Figueredo, and Cody Garbrandt. Originally a fight scheduled for 2020 for the flyweight championship. Figueredo and Garbrandt will now go at it in the bantamweight division. It's This is the opener on the early prelims on Fight Pass. Insane stuff. But you got Davidson Figueredo, who's 1-0 in the Bantamweight division and had a fight against Rob Font um, in December, a fight that, honestly, I didn't know was going to happen. I thought Rob Font was probably going to get the better of Figueredo. But Figueredo went in there, my goodness, Figueredo went in there and, you know, beat Rob Font basically from pillar to post and looked really good in his Bantamweight debut. Figueredo implemented the wrestling game. Late in that fight, he outstruck Rob Font. He won every single round in that one. And now he gets Cody Garbrandt. And I get this is a fight that people have wanted to see for a while. Cody Garbrandt's chin has looked better as of late, but man, I, I just think this is kind of a mismatch. I think it is. I think it is. Figueredo is a minus 300 favorite for a reason, and it makes sense. Figueredo has, I think, the striking advantage here. Cody Garbrandt, even though he is on a two-fight winning streak, it is against Trevin Jones and Brian Kelleher, two guys who have not seen the most success in the UFC. Trevin Jones is no longer a UFC fighter. He's split off to Cage Warriors, and he's one and one over there since the loss to Garbrandt. And the Brian Kelleher fight, I mean, Kelleher is not a striker. Kelleher is on a three-fight losing streak, and Cody Garbrandt did what he was supposed to do to Brian Kelleher. So when you look at everything involved in this fight, again, Everything points to a Figueredo victory. And again, Garbrandt has not been fighting the biggest power punchers. What happened the last time he fought a guy who has somewhat power? It's Kai Kara France. And Kai Kara France knocked him out in the first round. That was at flyweight, I get it. But then before that, he lost to Rob Font by decision. If you want to play MMA math, Figueredo beat Font, Font beat Garbrandt. But other than that, again, Garbrandt's last win over a ranked guy is the Rafaela Sunsau in 2020. And the UFC has been booking Garbrandt somewhat smartly, right? They've been booking him against guys who aren't top fighters. They've been booking him against non-ranked guys, which makes sense, again, because you want to get Garbrandt some wins. But now you put him put him back up against a top 15 guy and a top 10 guy in Garbrandt, or sorry, in Figueredo. I just think it's extremely difficult here for Cody Garbrandt. Again, the chin has been good recently, but the problem is he hasn't seen someone who hits as hard as Divas and Figueredo. I think Figueredo is going to chin him. I'll just be honest with you. I'm going to go Divas and Figueredo by first round knockout here. Um, I know Deuce, Deuce to get it is getting up there in age. He's 36 years old at this point, but the Rob Font victory was really good. Font does have a chin on him. If you watch Rob Font versus Cheeto Vera, again, Font eats so much damage and it's it still able to walk right through it and keep on fighting. I don't know if Garbrandt's going to be able to take all that damage from Figueredo and keep keep on fighting. I'm going to take Deuce to get a Divas and Figueredo to win the opener. I think he beats Cody Garbrandt by first round knockout. Not a controversial pick at all. I really don't think so. Um, I just think, again, Figueredo hits very hard. I don't know how Garbrandt Brandt's able to keep fighting um, with the power of Figueredo at the 135 pound division. I think Figueredo hits one of the, is one of the hardest hitters um, in this weight class, and I think he wins. Let's go on to our next one here. Um, a shame this one's this low on the card, but it is what it is. Bobby Green taking on Jim Miller. This is a good fight. Again, this is, you know, Jim Miller fought in UFC 100. He won, he won in UFC 200. And now he gets a chance to fight on UFC 300. Jim Miller at the age of 40 is still winning fights. He's on a two fight winning streak. His last two wins were Jesse Butler mm, and a win over Gabriel Benitez in his last one. He has won five out of his last six fights dating back to 2021. 
It started with a win over Eric Gonzalez, a win over Nicholas Moda, a win over Cowboy Cerrone, a loss to Alexander Hernandez, and then back-to-back -back wins over Jesse Butler and Gabriel Benitez. Um, again, Jim Miller has seen this late career resurgence, which is great, happy for the guy. Um, but the problem with this is, again, Jim Miller has only been beating guys who are kind of just making their way in the UFC or Cowboy Cerrone, who's more, who was more than washed up when he fought Jim Miller back in 2022, right? The fight that sticks out to me for Jim Miller as of late, right, is the Alexander Hernandez loss. Hernandez just lost to Damon Jackson last night. It's not like Alexander Hernandez is some world beater or anything, and Hernandez was able to go out there and outstrike Jim Miller for the full 15. The big question in this fight is Bobby Green's chin. Bobby Green just got knocked out in December. It's I know it's five months, but still he just got knocked out by Jalen Turner and immediately he's turning it around to a UFC 300 date against Jim Miller, a guy who can hit very hard and a guy who has melted guys. I mean, look at the way he knocks out Jesse Butler, right? I don't think Jesse Butler is the greatest, but he hits, he puts that left hook on Butler and Butler goes out cold, right? And Bobby Green took a lot of damage in the Jalen Turner fight because the referee, I guess, just wanted to see, uh, Kerry Hatley just wanted to see Bobby Green die in there, right? I mean, Green gets dropped and Jalen Turner just keeps on, you know, ground and pound for all 25 seconds. And like Bobby Green's done and the referee just, you know, lets it keep going for uh, way past the amount of time it's supposed to. Um, so that's the one concern I have with, with Bobby Green in this fight. Because if it wasn't for that, I mean, Bobby Green, he beats Grant Dawson. He's a big underdog, but he knocks out Grant Dawson in the first round. He beats Tony Ferguson. He looks really good in that fight, right? He loses to Drew Dober, sure, right? He loses to Islam Mahashev. He beats Hawk Paras. He beats Ali Aquinta. Again, I will make the I will I will die on this hill that Bobby Green beat Rafael Fazeev back in 2021. I think he did. Um, but now you get Green and Jim Miller. You know, you could see the grappling out of Miller come out here, but Bobby Green as a whole is pretty good takedown defense, right? It's it's hard to take him down. So I think you're going to see pretty much just a striking fight between Miller and Green. And it comes down to, for me, if Bobby Green can, you know, if his chin can hold up against Jim Miller. Because we haven't even talked about the other side of things, right? Bobby Green hits very hard too, right? You saw him melt Grant Dawson in their fight. And Jim Miller has had, you know, this is going to be walk number, oh God, uh, if I can do math real quick here, this is going to be walk number 55 for him you know, ever in a professional MMA fight. I know for Bobby Green too, he's fought a crap ton as well, right? Bobby Green has had, uh, this is going to be his 48th fight, right? Both these guys have been around for a very long time. It's two veterans of the sport. Green's 37, Miller's 40. Um, I think, I think Bobby Green's going to win though. I think he is, right? Jim Miller doesn't get wobbled the easiest, right? The last time he's been finished on the feet, you have to go all the way back to his loss against Dan Hooker in 2018. I think you get it right here. I think Bobby Green will finish Jim Miller. I'm gonna take Green to win by second round knockout. Again, for me, it's all a matter of Bobby Green can eat punches from Jim Miller. It's a matter of his if, of his chin. If his chin can hold up, Bobby Green will win this fight. And I don't think it's very competitive. I don't think, I think Bobby Green's gonna have his way on the feet if his chin can hold up. I think again, you look at the way Bobby Green fights, he doesn't really get, like when he gets hit, he does get hit, but which is an obvious thing to say, but Bobby Green usually rolls the punches very well. It is a shoulder roll, right? It's hard to hit the guy, right? Um, because his head movement and his movement as a whole is very good, but there are times where he does get caught. Again, you look at the Drew Dober fight, you look at his last fight against Jalen Turner, sure, he will get caught. I just don't know if Jim Miller is the guy that is going to catch him in there. I think Green is able able to eat some punches from, from Jim Miller. I think he's able to keep going forward. I'm going to take Bobby Green to beat Jim Miller here on the second fight of UFC 300. I think Green gets it done by second round TKO. He is the favorite in terms of the odds on topology. He is the underdog. More people picking Jim Miller. I think Green does get it done. I'm going to take Bobby King Green to pick up the victory by second round TKO. Let's go to our next one here. Uh, it's Jessica Andrade, Marina Rodriguez, right? Two Brazil Brazilian uh, fighters going at it here. And for Jessica Andrade, right, a big victory in her last one over Mackenzie Dern. She gets it done by TKO in the second round, um, snapping a three-fight losing streak that she did have. But again, the fighters she lost to, Aaron Blanchfield, Yan Jean Tatiana Suarez. Again, Suarez should, if she fights, will be in line for a title shot soon. Yan Jean fighting in the co-main event for the championship, and Aaron Blanchfield looked good until she fought Manon Fior. Um, but Andrade getting a big victory and a big win over Mackenzie Dern, but she's fighting another fighter who has beat Mackenzie Dern in the past in Marina Rodriguez. And she snapped a two fight losing streak um, by beating Michelle Watterson Gomez uh, just last year in, I believe, September. Yeah, she won the fight by second round TKO. 
Fermirina Rodriguez, again, was on a run, right? She beats Yan Zhan Nan at UFC 272 by split decision, then runs into Amanda Lemos in a main event, loses, and then drops the fight to Vina Janji Hoba. And then again, there she is beating Michelle Go Michelle Waters and Gomez. And then now she gets the fight with Andrade. You're going to see a striking fight in this one. I don't really expect anything else out of this. Um, it's just a matter of, again, if Andrade can close distance and really just work her inside shots. I think that's the pathway to success for Andrade in this fight. Um, and I, honestly, I think she's going to do it. I might give away the pick a little bit early here, but I'm going to take Jessica Andrade to win this fight by second round TKO. I just think she's better than Marina Rodriguez. Um, again, a win over Michelle Watterson at this point in Michelle Watterson's career doesn't really show much i'll be honest with you um it's not all that impressive the lots to janji hoba for rodriguez she just gets grounded in and the amanda lamos fight it wasn't the most eventful fight but i thought lamos won the first two rounds right lamos outstrikes rodriguez in the first and the second lamos takes her down the third of course lamos does get the finish if Amanda Lemos is finishing you on the feet, I think Jessica Andrade would do the same exact thing, right? Andrade did look very good in her last fight where she beats Mackenzie Dern. Um, I know, again, Mackenzie Dern can't strike. She really can't. But again, Andrade knocks her down once in the first round, then twice in the second, or sorry, three times in the second round, and really just dominates that one. Um, I think she'll beat Rodriguez because I think you see primarily a striking fight in this one. Um, on the ground, right? For Andrade, I think if anything, Andrade will have the advantage down there. Rodriguez hasn't really shown the best capability of winning fights in the ground. Um, Andrade, again, if she needs to, she can take fights down. She hasn't really done it in, since the uh, Lauren Murphy fight um, that she won at UFC 283 um, back in Brazil. So again, it's going to be primarily a striking bout in this one. And Rodriguez has been hit a lot before. I know she has her own TKO finishes. Again, the, the Watterson fight ended on the ground. But the Amanda Hebos win is probably Rodriguez's best win, right? She just beats the brakes off of Hebos on the feet. I just don't see her doing that to Andrade. I get Andrade can be chinny at times, um, but I don't really see it in this fight. I think, again, she is the better striker between her and Marina Rodriguez. I'm going to take Jessica Andrade to win the fight. Again, we're going to take her by second round TKO. Even odds in this one, I get it. Because, um, again, I think Rodriguez could edge out a decision if she can if you know if she can keep range and Andrade isn't able to really unload in her power and if the power is really not affecting Rodriguez all that much but I just don't see it I think Andrade wins I'll take her by second round TKO uh, let's go to our next one here Hedato Moicano takes on Jalen Turner so Money Moicano finds his way onto UFC 300 this was the final fight added to this card and he gets Jalen Turner and Turner again has been a little bit unlucky recently right he does beat Bobby Green looks very good doing so but the back-to-back -back fights over Dan or losses to Dan Hooker and Mateus Gamrot you can make the case he wins both those fights the Hooker fight I thought was very close I definitely thought he beat Gamrot eh, the Hooker fight you can go either way on it um again I, the Gamrot fight was close too but I just thought again Turner did enough to get the win um but the Bobby Green fight, right, Turner knocks him down and finishes him, right? Looks very good in, the, in that win. We will see how he's able to deal with the grappling game, though, of Hanato Moicano, because that's what Moicano does, right? Moicano loses fights because he's not able to get, to get the fights down, right? That's how he loses. His three, his three, he's been knocked out three times in the UFC um, against Fazeev did it, uh, Korean Zombie did it, and Jose Aldo did it, right? All those fights, he wasn't able to get the fight down, and then he gets finished on the feet. We will see if he's able to get Jalen Turner down, right? Look at the Brad Riddell fight. He's able to get Riddell on the mat. He gets him by a naked choke. The Drew Dober fight, he just grounds Dober, right? And, you know, the second round, um, I think it was this, what round did Dober win? I think it was the second round Dober wins, right? Um, but Moicano does his job, right? He gets the fight down, and he is able to ground Dober and win two rounds in that one. And again, that's what this fight is going to be. If Moicano can get Turner down, I think he wins. But Jalen Turner's not an easy guy to take down, though, right? Mateus Gamrot did do it four times. Say what you want about Mateus Gamrot. He is a pretty good wrestler. That's what Gamrot excels in, right? You, he, you saw that he was able to do that against RDA. He did that against Jalen Turner. The guy is pretty solid with his groundwork. Um... And then Matt Frivola took down Jalen Turner back in 2019 four times. My problem with Honeto Moicano is, though, he's not the best pure wrestler. His jiu-jitsu is very good, and he's able to remain competitive in some fights stand-up-wise. But again, can he win exchanges against Jalen Turner? I don't think so. But then again, can he get Jalen Turner down, and can he win the fight in terms of the grappling? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's tough. Because Jalen Turner is getting a lot better. Don't let the record deceive you. He's 14-7. and seven. Yeah, it's not the best record. But look at the guys that Jalen Turner has fought, though, in his UFC run, right? He comes in the UFC. He's 7-3 and three going to the UFC. First fight, he loses to Vicente Luque. 
He loses the fight to Matt Favola, where again, Favola is a borderline top 15 guy. Favola, Favola takes him down and gets him down, right? He goes on his winning streak, does Turner. He beats Josh Kaliva, he beats Brock Weaver. He beats uh, Eros Medic, he beats Jamie Mullerkey, he beats Brad Riddell, loses back-to-back -back fights to Gamrod and Hooker, then beats Bobby Green. Again, the record is, you know, on paper, it doesn't look all that great, but no, Jalen Turner is legit. This guy is very legit. Don't, don't you know, mistake that, right? He is a very solid fighter and he has just fought some incredibly tough guys in his tenure with the UFC. Um, so again, the question is, can he get Moicano down? Because Or can Moicano get him down, right? Because you've seen the Moicano, Moicano fights against Fazeev, right? He's not able to get Fazeev down. The RDA fight, he wasn't able to take RDA down. RDA was the one taking down Moicano and really RDA didn't see any danger of himself getting submitted. So it was just RDA really just punching Moicano's head in for the first... 22 minutes of the fight until Moicano won the last three minutes, right? Uh, Moicano did get subbed by Brian Ortega back in 2017. That's not really all that relevant. He gets finished by Jose Otto back in 2019, right in the second round. Zombie knocks him out. It was just a shutout, right? Moicano doesn't do anything in that fight in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, I'm just, I'm split because it's either going to be Moicano, you know, shocking a lot of people and he's able to successfully get Turner down a lot in this fight, or Jalen Turner just keeps the fight standing and knocks out Hanato Moicano pretty early. I'm going to lean Jalen Turner first round knockout. I think Turner is able to keep this fight on the feet, and I think it's going to be a very tough night um, in the office for Hanato Moicano. I, I like Money Moicano. I really do. I like the guy. Um, but I think, it's a, I think it's stylistically a tough fight because Jalen Turner, he's dealt with some struggles wrestling guys like Frivola and Mateus Gamrot. But Moicano is not a pure wrestler. Moicano is more of a jiu-jitsu guy who needs takedowns to really work his game. Can he get the takedowns against Turner? I don't think he's able to. Turner's been in a pretty solid run, even though he has lost two out of three. I don't think Moicano really dangerous threat, dangerous slash, slash threatens him stand-up wise. I think Jalen Turner kind of beats his head, and I'm going to take Jalen Turner to win the fight by first shot knockout. We go on to our next one here. Diego Lopez versus Sodik Youssef. Odds are almost even in this one. Youssef is coming off a loss in a main event against Edson Barbosa. How does Barbosa get rewarded? He gets a UFC Apex main event again against Leon Murphy. Uh, Youssef is on UFC 300. And he is fighting Diego Lopez, who has took the UFC by storm, obviously. He had the fight against Mosvar Avalev, where he looked good in a loss, and then comes back and it ar triangle arm bars Gavin Tucker in 98 seconds, and then knocks out Pat Sabatini in 90 seconds. And here we go, Diego Lopez is fighting on UFC 300. He's got all the hype in the world, man. He's got all the hype. The guy can strike, he can grapple, but he's taking on by far his toughest opponent. Actually, no, Evloyev is, tough, is a tougher opponent, but still, he's taking on a tough guy in Sodik Yusef, because Yusef hits hard. He does, right? He hits hard, and he's able to grapple really effectively, too. Um, this is an all-around very good fighter. Now, Yusef hasn't fought the highest level, or hasn't beat the highest level of guys, I will say, because the two fights that he has had against really stiff competition has been Edson Barbosa, and a very good fight, don't get me wrong. If that fight wasn't in the Apex, it'd be a lot more memorable. However, it was in the UFC Apex, and I'll be honest, I don't remember all that much about that fight. I just remember it was close until it wasn't, right? Barbosa gets dropped in the first round, Yusef wins the second, then, then Barbosa starts to take over and really starts to take over in the fourth and fifth rounds. Um, it's kind of that knockdown round the third that kind of does you know shift the momentum in terms of or in the in the way for um edson jr barbosa right so you know again yusef has a close fight against barbosa until again barbosa starts to take over late but again if it's a three round fight i think yusef does win i know it's five so it doesn't really count right so again barbosa ends up winning but when you look at Yusef, right, he's beating guys in the UFC. Don't get me wrong. Look at the guys he's beat. He's beat, he beat Mike Davis in the Contender Series. He beat Soman Mokhtarian by a uh, first-round knockout. He beats Shaman Morais. He beats Gabriel Benitez. He beats Andre Feely, right? Good wins, but he drops one to Arnold Allen. Both guys are undefeated going in that fight, at least in the UFC. He beats Alex Caceres, who... You know, Caceres is a top 15 guy, but, you know, Caceres has lost his share of fights. Don't get me wrong. He beats Don Shanus by first round submission in 30 seconds, but it's Don Shanus. And then he loses the fight to Barbosa. But then you look at Diego Lopez, right? The guy is a finisher. He goes out there and finishes fights. Can he finish Yusuf, a guy who has only been finished once, and that's all the way back in 2017 for the Titan FC Featherweight Championship? I don't know. I don't know. I like the fight, don't get me wrong, I really like it. This is a very this is a very fun fight. Because you know Yusef's gonna bring it, you know Lopez is going to go out there and try to sprint his way towards the finish. I think it's close. 
I'm gonna take Diego Lopez. I think the grappling is where Lopez, though, does find his way to victory in this one. I'm taking first round sub for Diego Lopez. I think Lopez somewhat blitzes him early in this fight. I think he gets Yusuf off balance, and I think he finds his way either through, to a knockdown or to a takedown, and I think that's where Lopez sees a lot of success in this fight, because Lopez is able to get him down, and then again, Lopez is able to grapple effectively in this fight. Uh, I'm taking Diego Lopez. I'm buying into the I'm buying into the hype. I'm fully buying into it. I picked against him in the Alvoya fight, because obviously everyone did. I picked for him in the Tucker fight, and I did actually pick against him in the Sabatini fight. I thought it was a little bit too much. I thought Sabatini was going to you know, play spoiler in that fight. It didn't happen. Now I'm officially buying in. I'm buying into the Diego Lopez hype. I think he beats Sodik Yusuf, right? I think he puts Yusuf on the back foot, and I think he does find a way to get the fight to the ground, and once it does get to the ground, I think Lopez sees a lot of success, right? Yusuf is, is a tough guy to get down, but Barbosa did do it a couple times, right? Arnold Allen was able to take down Sodik Yusuf and find a lot of success down there. Andre Feely was able, to, was able to take down Yusuf. That's where, again, I think Yusuf will struggle in this fight. It's going to be in the grappling game. I know he's never been submitted, but Diego Lopez feels like the guy that's able to finally submit him. I'm going to take Lopez to win the fight by first round sub. Again, this guy goes out there and finishes fights, taking Lopez by, by first round sub. Let's move on to our next one. And boy, do I have a lot to say about this fight. Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. How does Kayla Harrison possibly make 135 pounds? I don't know. This is a fighter who used to fight at 155 pounds. The PFL used to have a 155 pound division just for her. And they decided, okay, let's do 145 for her. She fought at 145. Um... Uh, she fought at 145, not last year though. It was um, back in Invicta. That's the only time she's ever fought 145. Is Invicta? It was the PFL didn't do a 2020 season, so Kayla Harrison had one fight in Invicta at 145 pounds, and she won it by second round TKO. That is the only time she's ever fought at 145 pounds. She has not fought at 145 since then because then the PFL goes back to the 155 pound season that she wins in 2021 in 2022 she loses though in the finals to Larissa Pacheco now my question to you is Kayla Harrison has trouble beating Marina Mohatina back in 2022 she does it and she wins every single round but still she has a little bit of trouble getting Marina Mohatina out of the ground and struggles in the feed against Marina Mohatina how the hell does she beat Holly Holm I get she's a minus 500 favorite but I feel like people are buying into the hype of Kayla Harrison a little bit too much here and I get it. She's fighting a 42-year-old Holly Holm. But I, I don't think I've ever picked an underdog at this, you know, at these odds. But I'll give away the pick right now. I'm going to explain my reasoning. I'm taking Holly Holm to beat Kayla Harrison by unanimous, unanimous decision. I don't think Kayla Harrison's going to be able to get her down. I don't think so. Like, okay, maybe that's a little bit of an over, over an exaggeration. But I don't think she's going to be able to hold Holly Holm down. I don't think she's going to be able to see the success that she had against some of these fighters that she beat in the PFL. Okay, she beats Aspen Ladd in her last fight at 150. I think the weight cut is also just a huge thing in this fight. She's never fought at 135, let alone, again, if this was at 145 pounds, I'd say Kayla Harrison wins this fight every, like all day, right? But it's at Bantamweight. I don't get it. I, I, the UFC still technically does have a 145 pound division. They don't really use it, but like, why Why wouldn't you just have Kayla Harrison fight Holly Holm for the inaugural, or for, well, that's not, it's not inaugural anymore, but for the vacant 145 pound title. You might as well do that, right? Make that the Kayla Harrison weight class. But making your cut to 135 pounds, I, because remember when Chris Cyborg signed with the UFC and the UFC was trying to make her fight 135 and they did a test weight cut and everything and she just possibly couldn't get down there. Like they were saying it was just too unhealthy for her to get down to 135 pounds. So they made a 145 pound division for her. I mean, she almost, she, right. She was like, she was, she was killing herself to make 140 when they had her fight that catchweight fight against Leslie Smith, I do believe. I um, remember it was in Brazil. Um, right. So they're making Harrison fight 135. I don't understand it. I really don't. I, I, I think the weight cuts huge. And again, I've watched every Kayla Harrison fight. I watched the PFL all the time, right? I've like, I think on Tapology it says like my most picked fighter is Kayla Harrison because she fights all the time. I think now it's actually Lupi Godinez because she fights all the time too. Um, even though I don't have a lot of you know successful picks of Lupi Godinez. I've never picked Kayla Harris. I've never picked against Kayla Harrison in a fight. I'm doing it right now. I'm, I'm all day. I'm doing it right now. I, I think Holly Holm beats her on the feet. Kayla Harrison is going to be lost against Holly Holm. Holly Holm is so much a better striker than Kayla Harrison. I get Holly Holm just lost to Myra Bueno Silva. It's technically a no contest now. Whatever. She lost the fight. She got her back taken and she got submitted. Kayla Harrison, though, again, 
She's a very good wrestler who has jujitsu skills. She's not gonna climb on Holly Holm's back and stand up, like standing. She's not gonna do that, right? Holly Holm's takedown defense is actually pretty good. Kellen Vieira did it once. Raquel Pennington did it once. Ronda Rousey wasn't able to take her down. I get Rousey, she claims she was concussed going into the fight, whatever, right? It's hard to take down Holly Holm. I get she's 42 years old. Kayla Harrison has not fought at 135 pounds yet in her career. She's gonna have to kill herself to make 135. How does that affect the chin? I don't know. That's why I think Holly Holm might be able to get a finish. I'm gonna take her by decision, but how does that affect your chin? How does that affect your cardio? It doesn't do good things. It does not do good things for your chin and your cardio. I think Holly Holm wins. She will have a reach advantage on the feet. I think she's gonna be able to keep distance. I don't think Kayla Harrison is able to get her down. I think this is going to be a failed signing for the UFC. I think Holly Holm absolutely melts her. Holly Holm wins the fight by unanimous decision. Might be my, you know, boldest take of this card, but I'm just not high on Kayla Harrison in this fight. I'm just not. Let's go on to our next one here. In the featherweight division, the Funk Master, Aljamain Sterling, makes his featherweight debut against one Calvin Cater. Calvin Cater, again, coming into this fight off, off of back-to-back -back losses, a fight that he should have beat Josh Emmett in. I thought he should have got the nod. They didn't give him the scorecards, whatever. And then he comes back. He beats or loses to Arnold Allen. Allen chops the legs. Cater really can't continue. He wins the fight, does Allen in the second round. Aljamain Sterling is coming off a loss to Sean O'Malley for the world championship at 135 pounds. The UFC hates Aljamain Sterling, so they made him fight that fight, you know, on three months' notice. They made him turn around immediately after going five rounds against Henry Cejudo. They made him fight. Sean O'Malley, he loses. They don't give him a rematch because, you know, got to move on. Um, and now, he, now he's fighting at 145. I, again, don't forget how good Aljamain Sterling is. He's not going to be absolutely killing himself as well now to make 135. He's going up to 145. And if you've seen Aljamain Sterling, the guy's huge. I don't know how he made 135 pounds like he was able to. But now he gets an 11 pound, you know, he gets 11 more pounds in allowance. Yeah, this is this is going to be the best version of Aljamain Sterling I think we've ever seen. And I think people are looking at, okay, like, well, he just got knocked out by Sean O'Malley. Well, okay, Sean O'Malley, say what you want about the guy. He's a tremendous striker. He is a very good striker, and it was a perfectly timed, uh, what was it? it was a right, right? Perfectly timed right that dropped Aljo and ended up winning the fight, right? It is what it is. Aljo blitz forward. I don't think it was the smartest game plan by Aljamain Sterling. I don't know why he did that, but it is what it is, right? He gets dropped and he loses the fight. But what did Aljo do before that? He goes and wins a five round decision against Henry Cejudo. He finishes TJ Dillashaw. He beats a uh, Piotr Jan in a five round decision. He submits Corey Santagin in the first round. And it's not like he's fighting like the, the, the elite of the 145 pound division. Calvin Keeter's good, but he's like a top 10 guy. Aljamain Sterling should be able to go out here and really do damage. He should be able to. Now again, Calvin Cater is a super tough guy to take down. He really is. Josh Emmett tried to take him down four times. He couldn't. Um, I think uh, Zabit tried to take him down four times. Yeah, Zabit only got him down once. But Aljamain Sterling again was able to take down Henry Cejudo. So... Like, I'm not too concerned about that. I think Aljo is able to take Calvin Cater down. And if he's able to get Calvin Cater down, he's the human backpack for a reason. I think he's able to find his way to the back. And I think he's able to submit Calvin Cater. Cater's only been submitted once. You go back to Elite XC back in 2008 against James Jones. Yeah, 2008 was the last time Calvin Cater was submitted. I think it happens again 16 years later. I think Aljamain Sterling submits Calvin Cater in the first round. He's going to find a way to the back. And he's going to find a way to get that rear naked choke. Um, Aljo's actually the younger fighter in this one. Calvin's 36. Aljo's 34. Um, again, I'm not concerned about Aljo taking down Calvin Cater. Because, again, the guy took down Henry Cejudo. If you're able to take down Henry Cejudo, I will have confidence in you being able to take down anybody. So I think he's going to be able to take down Calvin Cater. And on the feet, I don't think Aljo's some horrible striker. He just got caught against Sean O'Malley. I've seen this guy go out and win a first round against Piotr Jan in the feet when he needed to win a round because, again, that was the swing round in that second Aljo and Piotr Jan fight. Aljo outstruck Calvin Cater in the first. So I think Aljo is able to remain competitive on the feet against Calvin Cater up until the point where he's able to get the submission and he's able to, or able to get the takedown en route to the submission. Don't forget, Aljamain Sterling won the first round striking two against Sean O'Malley. He got overconfident in his striking game, then he went out there and he got knocked out in the second. Sure. 
but the guy's a very capable striker. I don't think Calvin Cater is going to one punch put him out. I think Aljo is more than capable of winning this fight, both on the feet and on the ground. I think he's going to need more than just the stand-up game, obviously, to beat Calvin Cater. But I do think, again, the combination of the striking and the grappling is going to be enough. I'm going to take the Funk Master, Aljamain Sterling, to go out there and beat Calvin Cater. We're going to take him by first round submission. To the featured prelim, Yuri Prohoshka taking on Alexander Rakic. It's a good fight. I'm surprised that the odds are where they are. I'm surprised Yuri's an underdog going into this fight. I get it. He lost to Alex Pereira, but a lot of guys will lose to Alex Pereira. Pereira is the champion, and he's in the main event of UFC 300 for a damn reason. Now you get Rakic and Prohoshka. Alexander Rakic has not fought since 2022, where he lost to Jan Blakovich. I know he blew his leg out, but still, he's not fought in that long. And now he's a favorite in a fight against a former champion in Prohoshka. I'll be honest, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it at all. Um, for Yuri, again, you look at the loss to Alex Pereira, it happens, right? Like Losses like that are going to happen to you. He beats Glover Teixeira in one of the best fights you're ever going to see, right? I know he was losing the fight up until the point where he gets the submission, but still, he comes back in the fifth round and he wins. He beats Dominic Reyes, he beats Volkan Uzdemir. I know Prohoshka will get hit. He's a guy, he's, you know, he's... He doesn't care. He's going to try to knock you out, but he doesn't care if he gets hit hard in the process as well, right? Like, don't forget, Dominic Reyes actually did knock him out in the second round. It's just that it was the up kick. Proshka falls right on Dominic Reyes. Nobody notices. He keeps on fighting. He comes to, and he wins the fight, right? He ends up coming back and spinning back elbows. Dominic Reyes in the head and puts him out, and Dominic Reyes has not been the same since, right? I know, again, that was kind of the John... He hasn't been the same since, really, the Jones fight, the Volkovich fight, but still... I don't think getting spinning elbowed in the head against Yuri Prohoshka is going to help. So now he gets Rakic. And like, okay, what is Rakic's best win? Thiago Santos, who's more than washed up? Like, seriously, he beat Thiago Santos. And Thiago Santos doesn't have knees anymore. He's won one fight in his last, I don't know, seven since losing to John Jones. He had the win over Johnny Walker. And that's it, right? Rakic beats him, okay? It was a fight where Rakic just boring out strikes him and then he gets his i think it was his brown belt in jujitsu after I don't, I don't understand um rakic beats anthony smith he chops his legs out and he wins the fight by decision it's in a main event it, it, it's not great he wins great i like it's boring like rakic will wrestle and he's kind of got the to me he's kind of just a boring fighter i'll be honest he kind of is um he's not all that entertaining like, you know, he picked up good wins on his way to the top 15. The Devin Clark wins nice. The win over Jimmy Manoa, the head kick's beautiful. But other than that, like, since then, Rockage has been kind of boring. Let's just, you know, let's just be honest here. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I, can Rockage take Proshka down? I, maybe. But on the feet, I'd like Proshka to beat Rockage. I, I get is there to be hit. But I don't think Rakic knocks him out on the feet. I don't think he does. If Rakic wins, I think it'll be by decision. I think Rakic will be staying on the outside. I think Rakic will be, again, striking well, um, using his jab effectively. But I don't think he necessarily can knock Prohoshka out. Um, I think if anything, Yuri's going to knock, knock Rakic out. And that's what I'm going to take. I'm going to take Yuri Prohoshka by first round knockout here. I just think, again, this is Rockage coming off of a knee surgery, has been in there for two years, and then he gets immediately booked against the number one guy in the weight class. I think, like, honestly, I'd rather see him against Blakovich, I think, right? Like, that would probably be a, a fight that, like, just do the rematch right away. Give him, I know that fight was scheduled for January, but still, like, just might as well rebook that fight. But you're going to give him Yuri Poroshka right off the bat? I just, I think that's a death sentence for the guy, man. I just really think it is. Um, I think Yuri goes out there and absolutely destroys him. I'll be honest with you. I think Proshka blitzes him. I think Proshka gets in his face. Um, and don't forget, this is a guy who, again, was a former champion who a lot of people thought was going to beat Alex Pereira. I don't think he's going to have that much trouble with the leg kicks of Rakic. I, again, the striking game as a whole, Proshka's seen much better. And Proshka, I don't, I mean, again, the much better is Alex Pereira. But, like, you know, he's been in there with tough strikers before. And he has gone out there and won the fight. Um, I think he's going to beat Rockage. I think he will. Um, I'm going to take Proshka. I think the power is going to be huge in this fight. I think he does see the better, get the better of Rockage in this one. I think Proshka does win. I think the layoff for Proshka is going to be huge. Or sorry, for Rockage is going to be huge. I get Rock or Proshka kind of just got knocked out, but still, I don't think Rockage is going to be able to chin him. So I'm going to take Yuri to win the fight by first round knockout. Let's go on to our next one here. Main card, main card opener here. I mean, we don't really have to spend that much time on this fight. 
Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. I don't like that this is on the main card. I really don't. Um, it just, it shouldn't be here because you know what's going to happen, right? Bo Nickel's going to beat Cody Brundage. Um, and I, I get Bo Nickel actually hasn't been the most impressive, I guess, with his wrestling so far in the UFC. I really like, right, like the Jamie Pickett fight, he eventually gets him, but it, you know, it's not like the, he doesn't like straight up melt him, right? Um, well, he, okay, he does, but like, I don't know. It, it takes him a little bit, the, a little bit to get the takedown. I didn't think it was gonna be, he was gonna see that much resistance at Jamie Pickett, and then he knocks out Val Woodburn, who just lost to Obon Elliott, right? So he beat a guy who was 0-2 in the UFC, and he beat Jamie Pickett, who was now retired, who never had the best run in the UFC either, right? And then Nichols wins on the Contender Series, Donovan Beard, Zachary Borrego, like they're not the best ones either. Now they're giving Cody Brundage, who is actually four and four in the UFC. Brundage is actually not that horrible. Um, but he was on a three fight losing streak and then he's gonna he's on his way to losing his J against jacob malcoon malcoon was obviously the better grappler and the better wrestler but then it was an elbow to the back of the head brundage couldn't continue he gets his win money he gets the win he comes back and he beats zach reese um he's on top of reese he picks him up he slams him reese can't finish can't keep the fight i think i think reese had a triangle choking if i'm not mistaken um and brundage ends up winning the fight by tko right so he wins by a slam Brunges wins, like, they're, they're Delta Lucian Bula by submission. It's Treshawn Gore by knockout. They're not the best guys. He's going to have trouble with the wrestling of Bo Nickel. I mean, again, you look at the odds. There is a reason a Bo Nickel is a minus 2,400 favorite in this fight. There's a reason for that. And there's a reason Brunges comes back at plus 1,200. Duh, right? Like, Bo Nickel's going to win the fight by first round sub. I think that's pretty obvious, right? Brunges saw a lot of had a lot of trouble dealing with the wrestling game of Jacob Malkoon. What's going to happen when you fight Bo Nickel? And it's not like Brunge is just some, you know, really good defensive wrestler who has heavy hands that can knock Nickel out on the feet. I don't think that's going to happen either. Yeah, I like Bo Nickel on the ground here in this fight, obviously. Again, this is not a controversial pick at all. I believe he's going to be the second biggest favorite in UFC history uh, when this fight does come, when this fight does close. Um, the only one other than that is... Uh, Alexander Romana versus Chase Sherman. I do believe Romana was a bigger favorite in that fight. And he ended up winning, so there's that. Um, but yeah, Bo Nickel is going to go out there and get the finishings. Cody Brundage is not going to take all that long. Uh, Bo Nickel by first round sub. This is the least controversial pick of this card. I think everyone agrees on that. Okay, let's go on to our next one here. Oh man, Charles Oliveira versus Armand Sarukian. The champion has a name and his name is Charles Oliveira. Now I'm not saying he's the champion right now because he's not. But Charles gets Saruki on in this fight. I, I don't know if the winner gets the title shot because Gagey and Holloway are fighting for the BMF title next. And like resume wise, I think Gagey's probably more deserving. I don't know. I, we'll see. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Charles Oliveira, Armand Sarukian is one hell of a fight. Sarukian is going to be the favorite in this one, which I don't know. I get Oliveira gets dropped a lot, and Oliveira does get knocked down a lot. But I've seen this story before. Sarukian has heavy hands, but we've seen Charles Oliveira knocked down by Poirier, Chandler, Gagey, happened in three fights in a row. He won every single fight. The one he couldn't win was Mahashev. That fight was closer than you remember though on the ground, and then he comes back and he beats Benil Dariush. Sarukian's not gonna wrestle. I don't think he's going to. Because I don't, unless he truly thinks he's a better grappler than Charles Oliveira, or he thinks his offensive wrestling can overpower the jujitsu game of Oliveira, I don't see Sarukian wrestling in this fight. And I see, honestly, Oliveira, I, you know, I don't think Oliveira is going to engage in that either. So I think you see a stand-up fight in this one. And I think Charles Oliveira can get the better of Armand Sarukian on the feet. I really do think so. I think if this fight hits the mat, it's going to be a result of a knockdown on either side. It's going to be either Sarukian knocking down Oliveira or Oliveira knocking down Sarukian. I think that's how the fight will reach the ground. It's going to be one of the two. I don't see it hitting the ground off of pure wrestling, though. I, I don't see that. Because, um, okay, maybe if Sarukian shoots on Oliveira, Oliveira will be more than willing to let Sarukian enter his guard. But Sarukia does have good ground and pound. He, he does have good offensive wrestling. Like he is able to, you know, move forward and he does have good pressure on top. So I don't know if Oliveira would be more than willing to engage in that. I think Oliveira, again, might, maybe he'll try to fight off the takedowns or maybe he'll, he'll be more than willing to accept that ground positioning. Maybe, I don't know. Um, 
Regardless, though, on the feet, this is interesting because, again, Sarukian has seen success stand up wise. His last loss is Mateus Gamrot in a fight where he did get taken down six times. Um, and in a fight where uh, Sarukian kind of does, you know, outstrike Gamrot, but Gamrot remains competitive. You know, I, I think if you compare Gamrot's striking game to Oliveira, I would probably take Oliveira in a pure kickboxing fight because Oliveira does have a lot of skills. Like, I get this guy, again, is known for his jujitsu, but his stand up game is. You know, I feel like it's been underrated for a very long time. People truly truly do know how good Oliveira truly is now with the striking game. Um, but again, precision beats power a lot of the times. And that's what Charles Oliveira has. He is a precise striker who will hit on the button almost every single time. I mean, you know, again, he, he came back against Poirier. He was able to get Poirier's back and submit him, right? Michael Chandler, he lands that big, that clean hook at the, at the beginning of the second round. Gagey again drops Oliveira twice until Oliveira comes back and knocks him out, right? Until, okay, we knocks him down and gets the submission, right? Eventually he finishes the fight, right? Ah, th this is, it's tough, but I, th I think Charles gets it. I'm gonna take Charles Oliveira to win the fight. I'd like Oliveira to get it. I think he's, I think he's gonna get it done. Oh, I don't know how he finishes it though. I'll, I'll take Oliveira by submission. I think it's gonna be a submission via the striking. I think it will be a punch that lands from Oliveira. It's going to wobble Sarukian. Oliveira is going to take his back and Oliveira is going to submit him. I think that's how this fight ends. I'm going to take second round sub for Charles Oliveira in this fight. Um, I think it's a competitive fight. I think it's very competitive. Because again, Sarukian is a good ground fighter. And Sarukian, again, you saw the Benil, the Benil Dariush fight, right? He knocks out Benil Dariush. He has power on the feet. But I think Oliveira is good enough to, if he does get dropped, I think he's able to stay in the fight. And I think his all around striking game is better than Benil's. So I don't think he's going to allow that to happen to him in the first place, right? So I think Charles gets the win here. I think Charles goes out there and Charles submits Armand Sarukian. I think he's able to get the knockdown. He's able to get him down. Um, again, I just like what I see out of Charles. Sarukian has beat guys, but don't forget, he had trouble beating Joaquim Silva a couple fights ago. He did get the win in the third, but that was a fight that he was supposed to absolutely melt Joaquim Silva in. I don't think he has the dominant wrestling performance against Oliveira like he did against Demir's Magulov. And I don't think he's going to be able to one-shot put him out like he did against Benil Dariush. So give me Charles Oliveira, the champion as a name, and his name is Charles Oliveira. What happens after this fight, I don't know, but I like in this specific fight, Charles Dubronx Oliveira to beat Armand Sarukian by second round submission. And now for the BMF Championship, Justin Gagey versus Max Blessed Holloway. This is a good one. Honestly, I think this should determine the number one contender for the lightweight championship. If it's Gagey, if it's Holloway, I think Holloway goes back down to 145 and just gets the title shot down there because he would be more than deserving, even without this win against Gagey. Like, okay, if this fight never happened, and say, okay, if he loses to Gagey, I don't think he gets a he gets a featherweight title shot. But if he beats Gagey, he should get it. And if this fight never happened in the first place, he should still get the title shot, right? I think so. Um, or at least he should be in line to fight Arnold Allen or Brian Ortega for the next shot, right? But you get Max Holloway and you get Justin Gagey. This is very fun. This is the fight I'm most looking forward to in this entire card. Because you know how Gagey fights, you know how Max Holloway fights. A lot of people are picking Gagey win by knockout. If it happens, it's going to be like in the fifth or the fourth. I I don't see him like knocking out Gagey early, or sorry, knocking out Holloway early because Max Holloway's chin is crazy, right? You saw that how much damage he took in the uh, in all three of the Volkanovski fights, but especially the third Volkanovski fight, right? Volk hits him with everything but the kitchen sink and Holloway refused to go down. Holloway doesn't even drop, right? I, like Max Holloway has never been even knocked down in his UFC career. Is Justin Gagey gonna be the first guy? If it would ever be someone, it would be Justin Gagey. Don't get me wrong. If anyone's ever going to knock down Max Holloway, it would be that guy right there. Because of the power he has and because of what striking he does have, right? However, I lean more towards he's not gonna be able to knock Holloway down. But then when you get into a pure striking fight, who's better, Gagey or Holloway, I tend to lean Gagey. I think the leg kick's gonna be absolutely huge in this fight. I don't know how Holloway's gonna be, goes, is going to be able to eat those leg kicks out of Gagey. That's probably the biggest factor for me in this fight is the, is the leg kicks that Gagey will throw. Cause that's what's gonna really throw Holloway off, I think. It's not gonna be a pure boxing fight. Um, Holloway's throwing a little bit, I think with the, with the leg kicks of Volkanovski, right? And Holloway, yeah, it did beat Arl Allen and he beat 
Korean zombie, but like again, those guys are not on the level of Justin Gagey. Holloway's going back up to 155 pounds. What happened the last time he fought at 155? Well, he lost to Dustin Poirier. It was a fight he's a minus 270 favorite in. Poirier ended up winning the fight. Holloway looked good early, um, but then Poirier again ended up, you know, as the fight progressed, he ended up winning it. The only round I would give Max Holloway would be the fourth. Um, maybe the second. Second was close. That's where you get the two rounds, I think, for Holloway. But uh, Poirier kind of just goes up there and really kind of does, I wouldn't say cruises to victory, but does win a very competitive fight. And I thought one, four out of five in that one, maybe three out of two, three out of five. But again, this is a very different fight. It's Justin Gagey. Gagey fights a lot different than Poirier, right? Poirier's a southpaw. Gagey's going to fight orthodox. Um, we will see. Again, though, I don't see Gagey finishing Holloway. If he does, I think it'll be through leg kicks, legitimately. I think he's got a better chance of finishing, Gage, finishing Holloway with the leg kicks than he does of knocking him out. Just because, again, Holloway's a guy that just doesn't get finished. However, it only takes one. It only takes one, right? And eventually the chin cracks. Uh, that's, just, that's just a given with all fighters. Will Gagey be the guy that's able to crack the chin of Max Holloway? Again, if it happens, if it's ever going to happen, it's going to be with Justin Gagey. Because that's just how hard this guy hits. But I'm tending to say it won't happen. But I'm hard pressed to pick anybody that will beat Justin Gagey at this point in Gagey's career in a pure striking fight. I really don't know if anyone can do it at this point. Truly. The way you beat Gagey is by mixing it up and by wrestling him. Max Holloway is not wrestling Justin Gagey. This is going to be a striking fight. And I think Justin Gagey, will, Justin Gagey will get the better of Max Holloway in a lot of these exchanges, but I think it's going to be kind of the point where, like, all right, Holloway, like, he's refused to go away. He can't get this guy out of here. But once the final horn sounds at the end of the 25, it's like, all right, well, Gagey won the fight. He won a pretty dominant decision. I'm taking Gagey to win. I'm taking him by unanimous decision. I'm taking him to win every round. Every round's going to go to Justin Gagey in this fight. I just think he's better striking-wise than Max Holloway. I just think he is, but I don't think he's able to finish him. And the leg kicks and the pure kickboxing as a whole is going to be too much. This will be a fun fight, don't get me wrong, but Justin Gagey's been in fun fights before, and he's been able to win these fun fights, right? He's not the same Justin Gagey that first came into the UFC, right? The, Eddie, the fight against Eddie Alvarez, the fight against Dustin Poirier, the fun fights that he loses. No, he's came back, and he's won these sort of fun fights like again the fight against michael chandler the fight against cowboy cerrone like he goes in there he just rely he doesn't rely on his power but uses his power effectively and wins a controlled fun fight like again the fight against chandler the fight against fazeev right wins that fight knocks out poirier right he gets he the one fight that is an outlier in all of these since that initial you know those first couple fights in the ufc is the Oliveira fight he overswings in that fight he gets caught off balance and gets knocked down right he tried too hard to knock out Oliveira in the first round that's how he lost but now he's on the cusp of another title fight if he can beat Max Holloway I think he's gonna do it I think Justin Gagey wins I think he wins a dominant decision again I just think he beats Max Holloway to the punch every single time Holloway may be quicker but the damage that Gagey is able to put on him with the strikes is gonna just be too much and I'm gonna take Justin Gagey to win a dominant decision against Max Holloway and still the BMF champion Mark Coleman gonna wrap the belt around him and then now, obviously, I think it's next for him to fight for the world championship. Justin Gagey should get the winner of Islam Mahashev and Dustin Poirier, which is crazy. Again, Poirier is getting the title shot right away um, after losing to Gagey and then beating Benoit Santini. But just, I guess, scheduling-wise, Poirier is the only guy, I guess. I don't know. But, yeah, give me Gagey to beat Max Holloway. He'll do it by unanimous decision. On to the co-main event. Um, yeah, it's not the greatest. Uh, it's Yang Zhanan versus uh, Zhang Wei Li for the strawweight championship. Um... It's a fight that should have happened in China. Let's just be honest. This would be a huge fight in China, but they did it in Las Vegas instead. And I don't know why this should this fight really doesn't have to be on 300, but it is. Uh, Zhang Weili, Yan Zhanan. I mean, again, Zhang Weili is the dominant champion, right? She's only lost twice in the UFC, and they're both to Rose Namajunas, which, again, why doesn't Rose come back to 115 pounds? I get the weight cut, but she's the only fighter to beat Zhang Weili ever and she could easily just walk straight in this division after this fight, assuming Zhang Wei Li wins and get the title shot immediately, I would think. Because again, she'd probably get an over Tatiana Suarez, and 115 isn't the strongest away class. It really isn't. She could easily walk right back in here and get the title shot. I get she lost to Carlos Barza in her last fight at 115, but why wouldn't you? Rose coming off a win at this point. They're looking for title challengers. They're not going to give it to the winner of Andrade and uh, Rodriguez. 
right? And that fight's at 125 pounds. Wait, no, it's at 115. What am I saying? That fight's at 115. Um, I think, right? Yeah, it's at 115. Um, they both fought at 125 before, but that fight's at straw weight. Um, they're not gonna give it to Suarez, I don't think. Suarez probably needs to win another fight. Well, mm, actually, if Andrade beats Rodriguez, maybe. But still, Rose could easily walk right back into this weight class and get a, a title shot. But still, Zhang Weili, Yang Zhanan. They're both 34, so Zhang Weili is somewhat getting up there in age. Again, she's not gonna be champion forever, right? I think eventually this reign will end likely to Tatiana Suarez, I think eventually. Um, but I just don't think Yang Zhanan's the fighter to beat her. I don't think she is. Sure, Yang Zhanan's got power, but Zhang Weili has dealt with fighters with power before, and she's beat them. Andrade, Ioana, didn't lose twice to Rose, but Zhang Weili's weathered the storm of a lot of good fighters, right? The Lamos win, she weathers the storm of Lamos and she beats her, right? And just dominates her wrestling. Um, the thing that stands out for me is Yan Zhanan um, had a lot of trouble grappling with one Carla Esparza. Esparza took, a da took her down and actually finished her on the ground. Yeah, Carla Esparza got a finish. That's how she got her title shot. How is she going to deal with the, the all-around strength in the wrestling game of, Wei of Zhang Weili? She's not. Zhang Wei Li will win the fight by second round TKO. I truly, she's gonna get her out of there. She's just that good. She's so much better than Yan Xiaonan. How does Yan win? Her only chance, I think, is if she really, you know, if if she knocks out Zhang Wei Li, like Zhang Wei, Zhang Wei Li got knocked out against Rose. I think that's the only chance if she, you know, stuns her, knocks her out. Other than that, I just don't see it. I just don't see the champion losing here. She's that good. Truly, Zhang Weili is, is that elite. She's that good in this weight class. And again, it's going to take a very tough fire to beat her. And I think that's why, if it's gonna be anyone, it's gonna be Tatiana Suarez. But it's not gonna be Yang Zhanan. It's just not going to be. Zhang Weili, I think her striking's better, her grappling's better, her wrestling's better, and she's all around stronger fighter. Right, she's all around better. Um, everyone's got power. She's dealt with power before. Again, I will say it in, time in and time out. Everyone can get caught, but I wouldn't bank on it. And that's the only way Yan Zhanan wins because Yan Zhanan is not going to be able to beat Zhang Weili in a fist fight, in a grappling fight, in a mixed martial arts fight for 25 minutes. Just not going to happen. Zhang Weili will find her way to the takedown. If Yan Zhanan is losing in wrestling and grappling exchanges to Carla Sparza, if she's getting taken down by Mackenzie Dern, Dern was able to find takedowns against her just two fights ago, Zhang Weili is going to be able to win. She got the title fight because she beat Jessica Andrade. She chinned Andrade in the first round. Okay, it happens. She's probably not going to be able to chin Zhang Weili. She's going to have to get very lucky to chin Zhang Weili. It's only happened once before. She got caught with that very nice head kick by Rosanama Yunus. I highly doubt we're going to see that happen again to the point where she just gets caught and chinned in the first round. I just I just don't see it, if I'm being honest. Uh, Zhang Weili, again, she'll find the takedown and she should be able to see a lot of success down there. Because again... Zhang Wei Li has out grappled a lot of good grapplers. Carla Esparza. Esparza did take her down, right, in the first, but Zhang Wei Li was able to pop right back up. Zhang Wei Li ended up getting a rear naked choke from a back crucifix in that fight. And then again, the Lamos fight, just pure domination on the ground. 50 43 in that fight. 16 minutes of control time. Pure wrestling. Got her in a crucifix a lot in that fight and just did so much damage to Lamos in there. Made Lamos look like she didn't deserve to be in the title shot. Title, the title fight. Zhang's gonna be able to beat Yan Zhanan. I'm not too concerned about it. Give me Zhang Weili to win the fight by second round TKO. I think it's gonna be a you know a striking ground and pound finish on the ground that's gonna be able to get her the win. Give me Zhang Weili to retain the championship and to the main event. Alex Pereira defends the light heavyweight championship against one Sweet Dreams, Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill's got a chance. He has a chance, I think so. But I, I do favor Pereira in this fight. I do. Um... Jamal Hill still hasn't really beat anyone in the elite of the weight class. He beat a 43-year-old Glover Teixeira. He beat Thiago Santos, who is well past his prime and doesn't have a chin. Or, sorry, doesn't have knees. Excuse me, doesn't have knees. He beat Johnny Walker, who's incredibly chinny. And he beat Jimmy Crew. That's it. Yeah, he's a former champion. Okay, well, he beat Teixeira, who's old. He's fighting... To share his protege and Alex Pereira, basically. I mean, well, they don't fight the same, but still, right? To share, will be in the corner of Poetan in this fight. And I get it, Poetan's getting old. He is, he's 36. But still, Jamal Hill, like, he's 32. And how does Jamal Hill win? He has to wrestle. He has no other option. He has to wrestle. 
My problem is Jamal Hill's never landed a takedown in the UFC. He's never done it. And it's not like Pereira's takedown defense is horrible. Jan Blakovich went three for eight, and Jan Blakovich actually did better wrestling against Israel Adesanya, I thought. Pereira was able to keep the fight standing and ended up winning it by split decision. Proshka took him down. Pereira was able to get back up. Proshka tried three times, only got one. Jamal Hill has never landed a takedown in the UFC. I know he's capable of doing it, don't get me wrong. And he ended up finishing the fight on the ground against Thiago Santos. Sure, yes. But technically, he has never gotten a takedown. The way he was able to beat Thiago Santos was Thiago Santos wrestling. Jamal Hill reversed it. Jamal Hill went, ended up winning the fight on the ground. Jamal Hill himself has never taken anyone down. He's the one that's actually gotten taken down a lot. Teixeira took him down twice. Wasn't able to do it that much, but still took him down twice. Thiago Santos took him down six times. Darko Stosic back in 2020 took him down six times in North Carolina. I think that fight was Blades Dos Santos uh, back in January 2020. Paul Craig got him down and submitted him and broke his arm. You're going to see a striking fight. And I think Poetan, again, it's hard to outstrike that guy. Alex Pereira will knock out Jamal Hill. It's going to be that highlight reel knockout that will end in the first round. Alex Pereira will knock out Jamal Hill by first round knockout. I'm sorry, but I can, I just, I, I don't want UFC 300 to end with Jamal Hill being the world champion. Just don't want it. Just don't want it. How does he win? He, he's gonna have to wrestle. Like I know, again, I know he doesn't use, doesn't use it, but you know it's there. You know, you know he has it in his back pocket, right? Like it's going to be there for Jamal Hill. Um, like he's gonna have to go there, right? So it's not like, like. <laughs> I, I know it's there, it doesn't matter how successful he'll be, he's gonna shoot, he's not going to go out there and just straight strike with Pereira. If he does, he will lose, he'll get knocked out, right? Guys have done that before and they've been knocked out. Sean Strickland, right? He said, no, I'm not gonna wrestle, I'm just gonna go out there and strike with him. Got knocked out. And you know how good Sean Strickland is, right? Um, Blakovich did it and it was a mix of wrestling and striking, but again, Pereira ended up winning the decision. I think Poetan keeps his striking, I think Poetan keeps it on the feet, and in that striking fight, Alex Pereira will knock out Jamal Hill and he will do it in the first round. I don't think Hill's able to find the, the grappling. I don't think he's able to find the takedown. I think Pereira keeps it standing and I think Pereira is gonna knock him out. Eventually he'll find the fight. He'll, fi he'll find that big shot. Probably be with the left. Pereira is gonna sit him down. Jamal Hill's not gonna hit him. The guy's that good on the feet. He's that good of a striker. I don't see Pereira losing this fight. The fight I'm scared of for Pereira truly is the fight with Magomed and Kalaev. That's a scary fight for Poetan. That's likely what's next. If Pereira takes zero damage in this fight, they might turn him around for 301 next month and fight Uncle Iev. That could get kind of scary. But in this fight against Hill, I don't see that much of a danger. I don't see him getting knocked out by Jamal Hill. I think Pereira is able to fight off the wrestling game of Jamal Hill. And I think Alex Pereira wins the fight. Alex Pereira, by first round knockout, the fight again that will get tricky for him is Uncle Iev. But we don't have to deal with that one just yet. Give me Alex Pereira to win the fight by first round knockout. So folks, that will do it for UFC 300. Maybe the biggest card of all time. Folks, thank you for watching. Make sure that subscribe button down below for more. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy the video. Make sure to comment if you do disagree with any of the picks. We'll be back tomorrow for PFL action. The main event, Impaka Sanganai taking on one Alex Easy Polizzi in the main event. Again, the light heavyweights and the lightweights are on the card. Rob Wilkinson, Tom Breeze. You got Patricky Pimple taking on one Clay Collard. Not going to want to miss that one tomorrow, folks. But thank you all for watching our UFC, our UFC 300 predictions. Make sure to subscribe button down below for more. And Mamba. Forever.